All right, Ryan Jarrell here for Low Kick MMA, and my next guest picked up a round one finish of Mike Breeden at UFC Vegas 38, and of course I have Alexander the Great Hernandez on the show. Alex, how are you? Doing well, brother. How are you? I'm good, man. And you looked really, really impressive your last fight out. You were, I believe, the biggest favorite on the card. Did you feel that added pressure not to just go in there and get the finish, but to look impressive doing so? Yeah, you know, I felt a little bit more anxious for this one than I did in my last. I think in my last fight, I was uh, too calm, almost a little too passive. So I really wanted to make sure that I had the right level of intensity going into this one. And, and I really wanted to embrace those those nerves going into it. So I did feel some of that. You know, every fight feels like you can't lose. But, but this one did have some some unique pressure, for sure. What was the game plan? Were you just going to try and uh, go in there and just flow in the first round, feel them out? Or did you have, like, a specific style that you really wanted to go in there and implement? Well, I, I knew – I know it's like being the newcomer, you know, entering, entering the octagon. And, so, and I know better than to underestimate those guys, so – I knew he was going to come in um, heavy. You know, he's going to swing heavy. He was going to go for the kill pretty early on. I feel like he would certainly do that on a short notice fight. So I wanted to give him time to make mistakes. I wanted to give myself time to fill him out. And I wanted to assess the fight. You know, I kind of treat him similar to my scheduled opponent in Santos. And then I wanted to, I wanted to blend my game. You know, I wanted to work the, the wrestling, whether I committed the shot or not. I wanted to give more looks. I don't know if I'm really the best at any specific facet, but I really think that I'm among the best at blending. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty I'm pretty good everywhere, so I, I need to be utilizing that. And that was my biggest takeaway from my last fight was that, man, we're not using a big part of our arsenal right now. So let's let's open the game up. Let's threaten the takedowns. Let's be dirty in the clinch. Um, and let's make them work, the up, down, the in-between. And so that's what I want to do in this fight. That's what we were able to, to do to get it done. And again, you looked really good doing it. I'm glad you mentioned uh, Leonardo Santos because I wanted to ask you, you know, how much different is that when you get a, a last minute replacement? Do you kind of tweak your game plan at all, depending on your opponent? Or is that something because I'm sure it's happened in the past and I'm, it's got to throw a little bit of a monkey wrench in there for you? Sure. Yeah, you got to make small adjustments. You know, so much of what we worked on in between wasn't so much for any specific opponent, but how to. Um, how to really better combat myself. Like, like what, what are my weaknesses? What are my uh, faults that people are going to look to counter on me? And then trying to mitigate and eliminate those. So facing any opponent, you know, I'm just a better version of myself. With the Santos fight, like I said, I had a lot of, I had a lot of ideas of things I wanted to work. Um, certain ways I might be able to expose him. And, and I didn't necessarily want to get rid of everything that I've been working on. You know, I just kind of wanted to draw it into this camp. Maybe just take a slightly different approach. Maybe not maybe not press as hard in this fight as I would have with the Santos fight. Maybe, again, let this guy make some mistakes versus in the Santos fight, I really wanted to break him early. So uh, similar, similar, but, but we do got to make some adjustments. Psychologically, I want to think about where this guy's coming from versus where my original opponent was coming from and be able to address that. Um, so, yeah, slight, slight changes. So for anybody that didn't get a chance to see the fight, run us through the finish, how it opened up, and ultimately how you got the job done. Yeah, so uh, like I said, I wanted to work. I wanted to work on the blend, meaning uh, the grappling and the striking. Right, I wanted to blend the game. So I, I went to test him on a, on a takedown entry, and he he hunkered really heavily on it. He really uh, committed to the defense, and he had he caught he was really good at uh, getting underhooks fast. Because he had those underhooks, I was able to come over the top. So, in my mind, it was just a a part of the process. You know, I didn't overcommit to the takedown. So, whenever he hunkered, I felt I had an opening to to strike and break on the clinch. And so, I was able to land a really big elbow on that first one. I saw that kind of wobbled him a little bit. Then after that, I was able to gauge my range, started to connect with my two, started to land my kicks. The whole game started to, to unravel at that point. And then whenever... Um, uh, we had maybe another exchange after that. I landed, um, I landed maybe four big shots, and then he went to counter. I went to slip under the underhook with a, with a takedown. Again, with his other hand, he did a really good job of securing the underhook. And uh, I came over the top again, clipped him with a hook, and then I, I just saw, I saw the look in his eyes change, and so I really started to go in for the kill at that point. I landed a really big two that knocked his mouthpiece out, and I just essentially went berserk at that point.
<laughs> and you really have a lot of power for this weight class, man. Are you starting to notice that and feel that the more that you're in the octagon? Because you're not a newcomer anymore. You've been around for a minute. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and that's why I was so frustrated with my performance against Moises in the fight before because I didn't have that power. I felt really flat. When I was punching, I was almost just like throwing hands to keep him away versus um, throwing, throwing to hurt him. And that was something that afterwards or even during I was just trying to work with because I was like, man, we're not – we don't really have our uh, our natural pop today, and so that that, that was frustrating. And, and then again, going into this spot, I wanted to make sure no matter what, I could be at the level of intensity that I needed uh, in order to have that power, in order to have my speed. I don't know if I have a huge power advantage over guys, but I definitely have a big speed advantage over guys. So I always want to make sure that that everything's firing in all cylinders. And uh, and when it is, you know, um, the technique shapes that power a lot of the times. You know, just being real crisp being real fast, being real sharp, and then the power the power finds itself. You know. And you mentioned that uh, fight with uh, Moises. That was all the way back in February uh, of this year. So it's been a while since we've seen you compete prior to this fight with Breeden. Was there a reason for such a, a lengthy layoff? Because I'm sure you wanted to stay a little bit more active. Yeah, I would have I would have fought in February again, you know, if it was up to me. I, you know, coming off a fight like that, I, w- I was like, man, I, I got to get right back in there. And it's just, it's just the matchmakers, you know. It's... Um, it's their timing, not mine. Mm-hmm. Are you hoping to maybe get a rematch with Moises or get that fight with Santos that you didn't get uh, uh, here when you ultimately uh, fought Breeden? Yeah, yeah. I really wanted to run that Santos fight back just because I prepared for it and it seemed like something that was that would be readily available by the end of the year. Um, Moises is great, too. It's not exciting to me at all right now. Uh, but then there's the other part of me that's like, man, you can stomp that guy out. Pretty easily, I think. So uh, I felt like that was me on a really, really bad day. So, and I still felt like I won that fight. So, so a part of me does. Another part has just been like so much of the cycle of moving forward uh, that that I'm not letting it really weigh on me at all or wear me down. So, um, my my biggest thing right now isn't so much the opponent, but a date. I, I really, I really just want to get volume. Like you said, I had a fight since February. That bothers that that bothers the hell out of me. You know waiting till October. And then if I'm gonna have to wait till potentially next February, you know, I'm sick of doing that. I don't want these two fights a year. I want three plus fights. So I I really want to get in against whomever, you know, by, by the end of the year. So how easy is it for you to make 155? If if you got a short notice opportunity to step in, because you're saying that a lot now in the UFC, could you step in like this weekend or next weekend? If you got the call? Yeah, I, I would like to have two week notice. Uh, three weeks would be great, but two weeks fine. But 55 is not hard for me to make. I make it pretty easily. Yeah, it's not the last walk- fight I came in kind of light, you know. So, mm. what do you walk around at typically? Uh, like a solid 77. Yep. Okay, yeah. So that yeah. that's that's normal cut then. Yeah, I, I a pretty normal cut. I mean, some guys, you know, I got buddies that get really big, like they get in the 80s, they get in the 90s. But but whenever we're actually training and we're working hard, I'm just always kind of in almost a camp mentality, almost in like a camp uh, work ethic, and so. I don't, I don't get that big, I and mean, I don't even know genetically I would, but I feel like when those guys who are kind of meeting that uh, workload that I'm that I'm that I'm at, they're normally they don't normally stay at those weights. They normally drop down and they don't feel too big or overwhelming. So I play with the idea of going down a weight, but I, I think that would that that might cost me too much. So I, I don't, maybe down the road, but right now, you know, 55 is a good home. Yeah, and it's a great division to be in. Obviously, you're back at the gym right now. Uh, you got a, a lot of killers a- around you on a day-to-day basis and uh, Factory X with Coach uh, Mark Montoya. Uh, tell me a little bit about that dynamic and learning under him because anyone I've ever interviewed that's out of that gym, they rave about how great of a coach he is. Yeah, you know, that that was in large part the reason I went there. You know, I stayed out with him for a week and uh, just res- respected him so much, his culture, the culture he instills in the gym and – uh, in that amount of time, you know, obviously just a week, but, but I'm, I'm good at reading people and I, mean, I couldn't find a blemish on the guy. You, you know, I just had, I had nothing but, uh, but admiration for him. And I think moving out there completely, uh, we really clicked, you know, we clicked really well and he, he's become more than a coach, but, you, you know, certainly a role model and, and like a father to me, you know, myself, the whole team has such respect and admiration for that guy. Um, and not just him again, it's the culture. That, that, that he propagates. So the, the whole gym, you know, um, are a bunch of a bunch of fucking wolves, you know, a bunch of killers, a bunch of grinders. And 
and I'm coming from a place where I never, you know, I never worked uh, consistently with UFC guys, so I had to be able to feel those bodies or that level of competition or, or technique. And so being in there, being in that room, man, I was scared for like the first, I woke up every day nervous for like eight weeks, you know, going to practice, just, you know, feeling uncomfortable, uh, walking in that fire. Rising to that, to that level of competition was huge for me. And it, it grew my IQ tremendously. It grew, uh, it grew the idea of, um, of blending to me and it, it, he adjusted my stance. He, he adjusted everything. You know, we made a lot of changes and I'm grateful for Ohana because of all the individual work I've, I've got. You know, I'm, I'm, I am, I am very solid everywhere, but I wasn't really good at putting it together. And then Mark taught me how to do that. Again, he elevated my IQ. So I knew how to assess the opponent better, assess myself better. And so for me, it was a night and day adjustment, you know? Yeah, that's fantastic to hear, man. I did want to ask you too, who are like your main training partners there? Do you have a couple of guys that you're primarily going with the most? Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes it depends the camp. You know, it certainly depends the camp, but we're all over the place because we've got good guys. At, we've got good guys from 25, you know, up, you know, the light heavyweight with Jacob, Dustin Jacoby, you know, from Brandon Roy Vall to Dustin Jacoby, everybody in between. So uh, I'll, I'll use Roy Vall because he's so sharp and he's taught me a lot in developing like certain feint movements and, and traps. And he's long, you know, he's a 25er, but for, for practically the same height of measurement. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit longer than him, you know, but. Um, and then I'll use, uh, even at 35, I use Chris Gutierrez and Jonathan Martinez a lot. Uh, 45, I use Yusuf a lot. Colin Anglin also, who's a newcomer. And then at 55, I use um, Vince Bichelle, uh Luigi Benjamini a lot. Um, some, some LFA rising prospects and Markel Maderos and uh, Jacoby Jones a lot. Uh, who else I use a lot at 55? Um, I use uh, another LFA guy. Uh, this thing, everybody's, it's either, it's just, it's just a phone call away, I feel like, between these LFA guys and the UFC guys. But uh, I'll use uh, a 170 year named Harris, uh, who, who's got good measurements for me also. I use him quite a bit. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 use, I use a good stable of guys all the time. I mean, I'm constantly always trying to get new bodies. I don't want to just be with the guy for too long. You know, I, I don't want to work with one or two people all the time. I'm constantly grabbing. Uh, I'm constantly grabbing new guys and, and we're always pushing each other. You know, I'm, I demand the most out of them and they know that. And so then they pull the most out of me every time too. Now I've got this, like, I've almost got, uh, like the stigma where if, you know, we're going together, they know I, I have a high expectation. So on days I'm feeling bad, they, they'll try to break me, you know, they'll try to push me. And so it's just, it's just a good atmosphere. It's good energy. Um, Jordan to is another guy I like to use a lot at 55. I mean, there, there's, there, there's a big stable, dude. It, that, that's what's so incredible about it. There's just so many bodies. Yeah, no shortage of bodies there. <laughs> that, there's no doubt about that, man. I did want to ask you, too, just about your standing in the lightweight division. Like, where where do you think you are from cracking that top 15? You know, I got to imagine you got to be pretty close. Yeah, it's just a fight away. It just depends on the opponent. You know, uh, we could do one fight and then crack the 15. We could just do it if it's convenient at the end of this year. You know, I definitely feel like now I'm at the, the maturity physically and mentally to, to, to be in there again, to, uh, to compete well and win and, and break even the top 10, the top five, you know. So um, we're just, it's one fight away, you know. Who wins the upcoming title fight, Oliveira and Poirier? I think Oliveira wins. I do. I think, I think he's got the momentum. He's got the mind. He's got the skill. Uh, it's no tough, you know, so it's no easy challenge. You know, they're, they're both. They're both champion quality fighters. I, I think that um, I think Oliveira just might have the edge in technique. Can't wait for it. Last question for me, man. If yeah. there is someone that you could call out, someone that you would like to fight next, is there anyone that comes to mind, or are you just going to jump in with whoever the UFC wants to give you? It's funny you said that because I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I woke up this morning kind of thinking it. I saw something about Patty Pimlet and and that maybe being a matchup. And I was like, oh, I'll take that fight too. You know, I I, I was thinking about. Uh, yeah, I kind of thought about the Moise thing, the Santos thing, you know. And, and at the end of the day, it's just, it's just the date for me. I, I don't, I don't, I don't really care the face or, or the opponent. I just, I, I want volume. Uh, I'm confident in myself. I'm confident that I, that I can, I can beat any of these guys here, and breaking in the top 15. So, uh, I just, and I'm confident that, that I'll be ready in time by December. So I, I just want, I just want to get another fight before the end of the year. It's lackluster of a response as that is. It's just, it's just where I'm at. You know, I just, I just, I just want the, I want the date.
I can't wait, man. Can't wait to see you back in the octagon. You're always must-see TV. Again, Alexander the Great Hernandez picks up another impressive victory, this time at UFC Vegas 38 over Mike Breeden. Pleasure talking to you, man. Before I let you go, I'm going to keep the floor. Tell people where to follow you on social media, and if you have anyone to thank, the floor is yours. Yeah, the great 155 on all social media. And then, of course, uh, Factory X and Ohana Academy Northeast is my gym. So if you're in Texas, check it out. Thanks, man. Make sure to subscribe to the Low Kick MMA YouTube channel for all the latest news, event previews, and interviews with some of the biggest stars in MMA.